Farms and Open Space, Preserving Rural Washtenaw County, in partnership with the Unitarian Universalist Church of Ann Arbor. So I thought it would be good before we kind of dive into all the programs um, in Washtenaw County um, and opportunities for farmland preservation uh, to kind of get a lay of the land for agriculture here. Now, all of this is based on the ag census data. Um, and this was actually from 2012. The 2017 is about to come out and I was hoping it was gonna be released last week. So some of this data is a little bit outdated, but it'd be interesting to see what comes out in a, in a short time to see how things have changed since 2012. So this is just looking at the acres of land, um, the percent of our land base here in Washtenaw County that is in agricultural production. Um, so you can see Washtenaw is right here. Um, the lighter the color, the lesser percent, the lower percentage of land is actually in farmland. Um, so it's just under 40% of our land base is in agricultural production. Um, and here looking at the change of the numbers of farms between 2007 and 2012. So we had a slight decrease in the number of farms um, here in Washtenaw County. It was just over 1%. Um, the interesting thing with this fact, though, is that the number of farms decreased, but actually the, the land, the acres in production increased slightly. Um, so I thought that was kind of an interesting um, fact. Um, looking at um, as some of the farmers that are here do do vegetable production, um, only one, between one and two percent of farming here is um, in vegetable production. Um, so a lot of the farms here are um, soy, um, corn, wheat rotations. Um, and looking at the percent of agricultural produ um, products sold directly to um, humans for consumption. So looking at here, we're about kind of in the medium range. Um, And then the percent of the farms that are actually owned by like families, not corporations, um, is so we actually have a pretty high percent. It's over 80% of the farms here are actually family owned or individual owned. And then again, looking at the average farm size. So for the entire county, the average is about 138 acres per farm. Um, but you can kind of see the range that they go from one to nine acres. Um, but we have very, very few larger farms. So they're really kind of in that middle range, again, being family owned. So that's just kind of a, a little bit of the lay of the land here. And I will turn it over to Larry. Okay, farmer's point of view. <laughs> um, I've never, I don't know, I've uh, lived on a farm all my life. Uh, a little bit of moving around here and there, but kind of ended up back on the farm. And... Uh, even even with that, I don't necessarily always consider myself a farmer. I don't know why. Um, probably because our farm, we never had the big John Deere tractors and the big combines and all that kind of stuff. We were we were kind of small time farmers. My dad worked uh, another job, uh, worked at the Chrysler Proving Grounds. Our farm is in Chelsea, out on uh, Heim Road. Uh, just west of the Chrysler Proving Grounds, down in that uh, corner of the township, corner of Sylvan Township. And um, the farm was, uh, came into the family in 1864. Um, October 11th, 1864, my uh, ancestors, uh, Simon and Genevieve Weber, uh, bought the farm from a guy uh, by the name of John Phelps. And we... Uh, we uncovered uh, a lot of information when we moved to the farm back in 1962, and we have all of the old deeds when it changed from hand to hand to hand, even before, some of them from before, um, you know, my family bought it. So that's kind of neat to have. So uh, there's a few old photos, and uh, this one here is from uh, the early 1900s. They, uh, I, I joke, you know, we, we didn't, you know, have the big equipment and stuff like that, but evidently back then my, my family raised horses, so they were kind of like a tractor dealer today, I guess, <laughs> so, or a car dealer. Uh, um, and this is another uh, old family picture. Uh, my grandmother uh, is one of the children in that uh, little carriage there. I think she's the one on the far left. And uh, she grew up on the farm. She was born in 1900. 
So uh, that's why I, I know this picture is sometime in the early, early 1900s. Uh, that barn is still standing. Um, and there's a little lean-to off of the, uh, this side of it, and which is where I currently uh, operate uh, my business out of. I have a little room there where I wash eggs in a refrigerator where you can come and buy eggs and chickens and honey and that sort of stuff there. So this is my grandmother, probably at around 18 years old. Um, she was a third generation owner. Uh, my grandma died in 2002, just a couple of weeks before her 102nd second birthday. Um, and my great uncle Otto Weber, that was her brother, uh, he was also then a third generation owner. I think this slide is just a little bit out of order. I'm not sure how that happened. Um, but we'll back up to that. Um, so. Prior to that, we had the uh, the first uh, generation, the first couple of generations, uh, Simeon Weber, and uh, so that'd be my great great grandfather, and then John Weber, which was my great grandfather. Then we had my grandmother, her brother, uh, and then there was another uncle. This is my parents, uh, fourth generation farm owners, and my dad is still living. My mom has passed, but uh, my dad is now uh, 91, and he still lives on the farm. Um, and for uh, sake of clarification, uh, he's actually still technically the owner of the farm, <laughs> uh, not myself, but my wife and I uh, will own this uh, sesquicentennial farm sometime in the future, but we're not looking for dad to go anywhere right away. Uh, not especially with the genes on that side of the family. So, so in, in 1964, the uh, farm was certified as a centennial farm and there was my dad uh, and his uncle, my great uncle Otto, uh, with the original sign from the Consumers Power Company put up there in front of the farmhouse. Uh, and then here just a few years ago when we, we had the farm certified as a sesquicentennial farm in the same family for 150 years, um, there's my dad with the new sign. And uh, this picture here is kind of uh, a lot like what the, those barns look like today. And uh, so the fifth generation farm owners, uh, there's myself and my wife. Uh, we took that picture at Chelsea's 175th uh, centennial uh, back in 2009. We were all uh, duded up in our centennial outfits. <laughs> so um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about why we chose to uh, preserve the family farm. Um, as you could see there, there's a lot of history. You know, when I, when, when I, when we grew up on the farm, uh, we always knew that date. We always knew that 1864 was, you know, the farm has been in the family since 1864. And, you know, what's that mean? Well, it means that, you know, there's just a lot of history there. So growing up, we raised, uh, cattle and sheep and chickens. We baled hay. We had, you know, fields of corn and oats that we used for the feed for those animals. And um, it was a lot of hard work, uh, you know, putting up hay always on the hottest day of the summer. And, um, but we got a connection to that land. We really got a connection. Um, I, I, I tell people during the summertime, uh, you couldn't find us. There was six kids in my family. And uh, the three brothers, I'm the oldest brother, uh, and I'm two younger. During the summer, you know, we were just gone somewhere. We'd set up our camp, our tents someplace in the farm, and, you know, just camp out, you know, over and over, you know, night after night after night. And, uh, you know, doing that, you know, we just, we just got this connection to the land. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons to uh, preserve a farm, uh, farm you know, a lot of, uh, you know, practical reasons. Um, but for us, a, lot, a big part of it was just, you know, we didn't want to see that spoiled. Uh, you know, we're, we knew what it was like. We wanted to be there. My wife and I don't have any children, but we got a bunch of nephews and nieces and grandnephews and nieces. And, uh, you know, we want them to be able to enjoy the farm for generations to come. So some of the reasons we chose to uh, do a conservation easement on the farm, and we'll talk a little bit more about conservation easements in a little bit. Um, we didn't want to see the entire farm split off into small bits with separate ownership. Um, 
my father was 89 years old when we did the conservation easement, and uh, he lives on a fixed income. So by selling a conservation easement, uh, he was able to use the proceeds of that to help assure he could continue to live independently. Um, and he could help other family members if, if needed and the need came up. And it's also going to uh, give him the ability to leave a little something to um, you know, the rest of his children and his estate uh, planning. It's like, I'm gonna get the farm and the rest of the kids are gonna get some cash and you know, so I'll get to be land poor and they get some money. <laughs> um, we have a little family recreation area on the farm uh, with a pole barn, a pond, a little summer cottage. And the space over the years has been used for family reunions, um, graduation parties, class reunions, weddings. Um, my wife and I were married in uh, our church in Chelsea and we had our wedding reception out at the farm. It was, uh, it was just beautiful. Um, many generations, uh, young and old members of the family love to hunt on the property, mostly deer and um, we grow them big out there. This past year was a pretty good, pretty good year for it. Um, as I said, my parents had six children and they're the fourth generation's owners of the farm and so they were faced with the dilemma, uh, how to keep the farm together as one parcel, you know, without splitting it up six ways. So the conservation did, easement did exactly that. Um, even if the land were to be sold outside of the family, God forbid, uh, it would still have to stay as one track of land and the conservation easement goes along with that. So it's still not going to be developed. So, you know, it, it, it's not going to be sold outside the family by me, but you know, if you know, two, three, four generations down the road, you never know what's going to happen. And that's what, uh, you know, preserving land is all about, not just what's going on today, but what's going to go on down the road. So as the next owners of the farm, my wife and I, uh, we plan to establish some sort of mechanism, and we're actually kind of working with some attorneys right now to kind of figure out exactly how that's gonna work. Uh, trying to figure out a, a right mechanism by which the farm can stay in the ownership of the family, you know, for generations to come. And we want the whole family to be able to enjoy uh, all the land as we have all, our, all of our lives. Um, We'll talk a little bit about this later when we come uh, to Legacy Land Conservancy and what they do, but um, well, one of the things we talk about with Legacy is um, fresh waters, uh, working farms, and places to play. And uh, our farm has all three. Um, we have fresh waters, Mill Creek runs through our farm, and uh, Mill Creek eventually comes out into the Huron River. Um, we have, uh, it's a working farm, about 100 acres of land of the fields are leased to a nearby farmer that does uh, crop rotation farming. And then I run a small uh, meat and egg poultry business on the farm. And I sell eggs and chicken eggs, duck eggs, chickens, ducks, gonna do some turkeys this year. Um, and uh, we certainly have places to play, like I said before. Uh, you know, we, we have a lot of stuff going on out of that little recreation area. So uh, in that area, we went three for three, all, all three areas. So um, I was interested in seeing what Ginny had on one of those slides, uh, said the, the average value uh, per farm sold directly for human consumption, I think on that slide was about eight to $9,000. Well, I'm happy to say that I beat that. <laughs> so, and that's all we have right now for this portion of it. And um, I'm turning it over to Hannah. So my name is Hannah Weber. Uh, I have a small scale vegetable operation called the Land Loom, which I farm uh, just a couple of acres, maybe a little bit less this year on uh, Ann Arbor Township owned land that is currently under a conservation program. Um, I started my program or my business in 2015, uh, primarily doing salad greens, which I sold through a uh, CSA type uh, program, which I called the Salad Club, where my members pay ahead of time for a uh, full session of weekly salad greens. Um, I did not come from a farming background. Uh, my parents are healthcare professionals, but they brought me up in a CSA and I was kind of uh, introduced to small scale farming from a very young age. And it definitely uh, 
contributed to my my interest in it uh, in the long term. Um, uh, over the past four years, I have kind of developed my my farm and grown and shrunk it depending on you know. Uh, the challenges of the last year. Um, I now have uh, cultivating about an acre of uh, land, including a 30 by 144 foot uh, passive solar greenhouse. Um, I grow a variety of warm season vegetables, which I sell through the Carytown Farmers Market, uh, the collective CSA, the, the farm at St. Joe's uh, currently puts on, a lot through Argus Farm Stop um, and a couple of different restaurants in the area, namely uh, Spencer Restaurant, uh, Miss Kim, uh, The Grange, and The Roadhouse. Um, I have been very fortunate to be able to start my business on the Tillian Farm Development Center, which is the incubator program that has been running out of the Ann Arbor Township land for probably about 10 years. I, it's been under a, a number of different um, organizations who have administered this uh, incubator program, but for the most part, it's been a really great success uh, graduating uh, new beginning farmers such as Sealy Farm and Green Things Farm. Um, and I think that's been a big part due to the conservation of that land and the wishes of the township to uh, create a resource for beginning farmers to start their um, businesses uh, before they have to uh, make capital purchases and make really uh, strong investments in their business. Um, while I have been fortunate to farm at uh, Tillian for the last four years, I have also been looking for land of my own to purchase. And I also believe that um, the conservation easement and um, the ability to buy land at agricultural value is potentially one of the the only ways that I would be able to purchase uh, farmland. Um, I have in the past uh, had uh, purchase agreements on on pieces of land where I was working with the current owner to put an easement on it and you know they've uh, fallen through here and there for uh, a number of reasons but I've learned a lot about uh, the the ways that these uh, things can uh, be done and it's a it's very uh, interesting uh, option for a lot of uh, landowners I think um, I think that I'll just end this by saying that it's um, again, a, a really great opportunity for beginning farmers to have this opportunity to buy conserved land. Um, I think uh, it's yet to be seen kind of the, the very long-term uh, effects of having your land in conservation, whether it's, um, you know, uh, like Larry Dahl said, being able to have it in your, in your uh, family for long-term or knowing that it's going to be um, conserved for a long period of time. Um, and I really look forward to learning more about this process because I think it's a really valuable uh, opportunity here. So I'll turn it over. So um, does everybody know what a CSA is, by the way? Hannah mentioned them. Okay, so a CSA is Community Supported Agriculture. It's when you pay up front, you give Hannah your money up front, and she gives you in return vegetables for a certain period of time, 16 weeks or whatever the time is that you agree, but you have given her the money up front and it helps her to pay the cost of the seeds and the equipment that she needs, and then you are getting the benefits. You're also sharing in the bounty of the season or the troubles of the season. So if you get flea bugs or something in your lettuce, or if Hannah does, then you might understand more about how hard it is to be a farmer. So community-supported agriculture in Ann Arbor is probably one of the more, robu more robust places in the country. We have more CSAs, and actually I have a flyer for the CSA fair that's coming up in March. If you wanted to try to do a CSA, there's actually a group that's meeting at Bloom, and they're gonna, like all the different CSA people are gonna be there, and you can kind of shop from CSA. So that's one way that you can shop for local food. Another way is the way that you guys probably all do, which is at the farmer's market, which is a great, thing. But this is what a grocery store can look like with stuff that's only grown in Michigan. I mean, this is like, why do we need to 
shop with stuff that was grown in California. We we really, it's a, it's a big problem with how we've become shoppers. So we've just taken the traditional farmer's market model and we've expanded it to year round. And with the goal to see what these farmers could grow in the middle of winter, which is amazing. If you look at our produce deck right now, we have lettuce, we have spinach, we have, um, well, rutabagas, um, parsnips, turnips, radishes, tons of roots, Jerusalem artichokes. We have a beautiful produce deck. And I'm, I'm always proud of what the farmers have been able to bring to us in the middle of, I mean, we had a polar vortex. You would think that that thing would be empty. It's not. So local farms can grow far beyond a one day a week farmer's market. Um, I love the farmer's market. It creates community. It creates a way for you to know who your farmer is. But if you're a business person, being relegated to a selling model where it's one day per week, nine months of the year, um, when the weather is good, it's just a not a it's we have not put farmers in the best position, and instead we grow all our stuff in Salinas, California, and ship it in cars or in trucks, and um, the fuel alone to ship lettuce from California here is energy wise like 45 times the amount of energy you get from actually eating that. It doesn't make any sense how we are doing this. So that's what our produce deck looks like. Um, we love Italian. We love these incubator programs. That's how we met Hannah and we've watched her grow. We've watched her create a brand. People come into our produce deck and they're just like, oh, I just want the Landloom stuff. They know her. It's, it's branding. Uh, so I explained CSAs, and you heard from Hannah which restaurants in town are truly farm-to-table restaurants. So the, it's a big thing now to say that you're local, but it's not always true. Like a lot of the restaurants will put on there that they're buying from a local farm, and they put it on there and they buy from that farm for a couple weeks, and then they stop doing it, but that's still on the menu. So... Uh, we have some great restaurants that are regularly buying from local farms. So that's what we do. And I, so Larry had said the average from the slides is um, $9,000 from a farm. We have 200 farms that sell through Argus. Remember, like, there's people who have just asparagus, just quince, just dahlias, right? But we've got 25 farms who make $30,000 or more at our store because, well, we have meat. You know, we have a lot of other products. We have every, we have a complete range. So we have a pretty significant impact on the budget of a small farm. And that was our goal in starting the store. And then we expanded to a second one. So, um, and one other statistic that didn't come out is that when you look at the agricultural census, if you look at the ag census in 1950 for Washtenaw County, and then you compare it to 2012, what, what would be your guess about how much farmland, how many farms we've lost in terms of sheer farms, like the number of farms? What percentage of farms have been lost in that 62 years? Anybody have a guess? 93%. 93% of our farms are gone from 1950 to 2012. So, and that's from the ag census. But the numbers... So you look at 2007 into 2012, the number doesn't look so bad. You think there's a little decrease and the average farm size is increasing. But look from 1950, we are losing the ability to grow food and we're shipping it all in, in the plastic that it was grown in from California. So it, that's just not a sustainable model for any of us. And so that's one of the reasons we started this. So Remy is coming up and he's going to start talking about local preservation opportunities. All right. Um, I want to start by uh, addressing something um, that's been mentioned, which is preservation. What does preservation actually mean? Uh, when we're speaking in technical terms, let's dive into the details here. That's why we came. Um, there are a lot of programs uh, that buy land. You know, the DNR acquires land in and around the Waterloo and Pinckney State Rec area so that we can all go out and enjoy it. But at some point, uh, the opportunities for adding new public lands to the map uh, have or do peak 
or at the very least, other lands that are not adjacent to those larger public areas, those owners are interested in, what about my legacy on this property? What happens to my individual property? Um, I can't sell to the DNR, I can't sell to the county, I can't sell to the local municipality to create a public park because they don't want it because it's not adjacent to something else. So in the 80s, this com or 70s and 80s, this conversation uh, started happening about private property pre preservation. Um, so what came of that was uh, at the federal level, there was enabling legislation for what is called a conservation easement. And then the state legislation in Mich Michigan followed soon after. A conservation easement is the tool that all of the programs that you've ever heard of doing land preservation use to protect land. Um, it's not the tool that just the local programs here use. There are 1,200 nonprofit land conservancies in America that use conservation easements to protect land. There is more land, private land, protected with conservation easements uh, in the United States than there is land in the state of Nebraska. It's a huge uh, part of our green infrastructure across the United States. So when we talk about uh, private land preservation, we're talking about a tool called the conservation easement. And what it is, is, is a legal agreement between a private landowner and an entity, whether that be a nonprofit or a government agency, where they've made an agreement that forever, in perpetuity, this land will not be developed. Um, there are some other broad stipulations about how the forests need to be managed, um, subdivision of the legal tax parcels within the boundary, uh, but all in all, what you're looking at is we're going to reduce the amount of concrete getting laid on this land. There will not be a Walmart in the back 40. It's forever going to be a woodlot, so it's going to preserve the viability of that local agriculture, it's going to preserve the water quality of that stream running through the property, and it's going to preserve all the private lands that weren't eligible or the landowner didn't desire adding it to the public domain. So, colloquially, that's also known, conservation easements are the tool by which we accomplish purchase of development rights, which may be something you've all Heard of. So I, I see some heads nodding. Um, it's because a conservation easement uh, impacts the development value of a property. If you take development off the table, that's going to change a land price. Okay. Um, so let's say there's an 80-acre farm in Washtenaw County, and currently it's listed on the market for $500,000. That's a steal, but let's just hypothetically say $500,000 for 80 acres. Um, a conservation easement, if that farm's protected, it can no longer be developed. So some of the value's been taken away from the farm, so the price is going to be lowered. And let's say that drops it to $200,000. That means someone, some farmer, who's looking for 80 acres, because now all it could ever be is farmland, because it's protected, is willing to pay $200,000. The difference is $300,000. And that's the value of the conservation easement. That's the value of the development rights. That's what a landowner or an agency is purchasing or compensating a landowner for so that they can make the private preservation of their property a reality. The question we've been talking about and getting around tonight is how does that help the new generation or the existing generation of farmers? Well, as Larry mentioned, many farmers are land rich and cash poor. There's a value locked in that land that they cannot realize without selling it. So unless you're going to sell it to a developer, it's just going to sit there, and you're going to pay taxes on it, and you'll be land rich and cash poor. The easement takes development off the table and compensates the landowner for that value so that they can realize a portion of the land's value in their lifetime, contributing to retirement, contributing into reinvestment in infrastructure on the farm, diversification, and potentially even buying more land adjacent so that they can preserve more land and keep the ball rolling. Um, how does it help the next generation, Hannah? It helps her because if that land dropped from $500,000 to $200,000, I'm guessing that's a lot more feasible for a mortgage for someone our age uh, than it is um, at the $500,000 level. So it's, it's through this private land preservation we're making incremental progress in opening up additional opportunities for future farmers to affordably access new property. That was the background. I'm actually here to talk about the Green Belt Program. Oh, I'm supposed to hit the thing, aren't I? Hi. 
So hi, I'm Remy Long. Um, I launched into it because I really like this stuff. Um, I am the manager of the Ann Arbor Greenbelt program. So the, the Ann Arbor Greenbelt program is one of several conservation programs in Washtenaw County. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll get into, well, actually, I will mention now. What's amazing about this area, and I want you all to know this and really let it sink in, of all those conservation programs across the United States, there are very few places that have this high of a density of conservation programs available to the public. Here in Washtenaw County, we have the county's conservation program, which Ginny will speak to. We have the Green Belt program, which is the city's effort um, to preserve land around uh, the, the city of Ann Arbor. We have four townships in Washtenaw County that have conservation easement funding and programming. Um, and we have two nonprofit land conservancies serving the area. That is unbelievable. And we should all be really excited about it and take uh, more pride in that um, availability of programming. So what slides do I have? This is the Green Belt. Uh, the Green Belt started with a millage uh, that was passed by city taxpayers in 2003, uh, one half mill tax for 30 years to leverage funds for the preservation of farmland and open space outside of the city of Ann Arbor in the Greenbelt District, which you see in the green outline there. And then a portion of the funds are also allocated to purchase new parkland within the city limits. So the millage was actually twofold in its mission, um, preserving open space, green infrastructure uh, uh, outside of the city and adding new parkland within city limits. So uh, the millage raises about $2 million annually. Uh, in, in the end, over the 30 years, we're expecting um, through the bonding process, hopefully about $80 million all in all will be realized for land conservation in the Greenbelt District and city limits. Uh, so there are two commissions um, that city council has uh, formed uh, to oversee the use uh, or the, the management of these programs. One is the Greenbelt Advisory Commission, which is tasked with um, assessing properties that are nominated within the Greenbelt District. And the other is the Parks Advisory Commission, which oversees many things related to parks in the city. But one of the things they oversee is um, potential new park acquisitions within city limits. So two thirds of the funds are for the Greenbelt District. One third of the funds are for city parks. Uh, to date, the Greenbelt program has protected, that constitutes 5,345 acres, 0.28 included, um, uh, in the Greenbelt District uh, since the program began in 2003. Um, one of the key uh, uh, focuses of the program is to leverage the funds. Um, we have to act quickly. We have to preserve farmland when we can at times, but we also make sure that we're uh, doing our best fiduciary responsibility with taxpayer dollars to leverage those funds. So uh, to date, um, the Greenbelt has contributed uh, $22.9 million toward acquisitions and leveraged over $22 million to match that. So it's about a one-to-one -one exchange or one-to-one -one match that the program's achieved so far, which is across the country a very impressive uh, uh, number. Um, within the Green Belt Strategic Plan, there, there are four, uh, four key focuses. One, building priority 1,000-acre uh, blocks of farmland. So what you see right now somewhat resembles buckshot <laughs> on a page. It's not the neatest, you know. Uh, I think when Maybe the original millage was passed. Some people thought, oh, it'll be this perfect ring around the city. L land acquisition and real estate doesn't necessarily work like that. You acquire parcel by parcel. You protect farm by farm what's available, what's coming to the table. But you do focus on building these viable blocks of agriculture because we know that when farms get split up further and further and the distances between them are spread out more and more, the ability for those farmers to share resources and infrastructure with one another become more and more stressed and they're further and further away from the focal points of their resources. Where do they get their seed? Where are their markets? So our focus is building 1,000 acre blocks within uh, the Greenbelt District. Two, um, open space protection, which really focuses on protecting headwaters of the Huron River. Um, we really want to protect our source waters. Uh, so you'll see some of the, pro or 
not in this map, but if there were the streams layer in this map, you would see a lot of these properties contain some of the headwaters um, heading to the main stem of the Huron. Uh, three, I mentioned, was leveraging funds and creating partnerships, which I touched on is very unique and very exciting in this area uh, with Ann Arbor Township, uh, Lodi Township, Webster Township, Sio Township, Legacy Land Conservancy, Southeast Michigan Land Conservancy, Washington County, and a bunch of other players at the table making this uh, work happen. So, <clears throat> and finally, the fourth point is exactly what I'm doing now. The Green Belt seeks to educate the public and engage them on our success and your success by passing this millage. So, that's it. Okay, I'm going to put my other hat on here, my trustee pin. Um, hi, I'm Larry Dahl. <laughs> I'm a member of the Board of Trustees at Legacy Land Conservancy. Um, also present tonight, Jenny is also a member of the Board of Trustees at Legacy. And we have our Executive Director over here, Diana Kern. Um, Legacy Land Conservancy does uh, is one of the nonprofit uh, conservancies that Remy mentioned in his talk that's here in Washtenaw County. It was founded in 1971, uh, and uh, it's the Michigan's oldest organization dedicated to the voluntary conservation of locally important land. It's a 501c3. We gladly take your contributions, and you may take a tax deduction for that. Um, We've been around for almost 50 years. In 2021, uh, we will be celebrating our 50th year. Um, over, the, over the years, we've grown. In uh, 1989, the Potawatomi Land Trust was formed to focus on farmland protection. And in 1999, Washtenaw Land Conservancy, which was the original name of, the, uh, of Legacy, merged with the Potawatomi Land Trust to form the Washtenaw Land Trust. And then in 2008, we extended our service area into Jackson. And uh, in the course of that, it didn't make sense to be servicing Jackson being called the Washtenaw Land Trust. So at that time, uh, we changed our name to the Legacy Land Conservancy. Um, shortly thereafter, Legacy became one of the first accredited land trusts in the nation, uh, accredited by the Land Trust Alliance. We uh, were able to receive a reaccreditation in 2014, and we are working on another round of reaccreditation right now. Um, we take pride in protecting land that falls into those three categories that I talked about before: fresh waters, working farms, places to play, and uh, naturally, some places have all three. Um, but our focus tonight is mostly on the working farms. Um, currently. Uh, Legacy uh, protects 25 farms totaling over uh, 2,200 acres. And we're looking for additional paths and partnerships to constantly protect more farmland uh, all throughout Washtenaw County and Jackson County. We have a, a very nice pipeline of projects that we're looking at. Uh, they, every now and then you do get donated easements. Uh, Remy was talking about how the conservation easement works. You got the value of the land before the uh, while there's still development rights and you got the value of the land after the developments are sold, well, you can receive money for that uh, by selling the development rights to a land trust or to Washtenaw County Parks or to the Green Belt. Uh, some landowners also choose to donate those uh, development rights to uh, the land trust, and they can then use that uh, as a tax deduction in various ways. Um, on the farm that, uh, that I live on, the conservation easement, uh, and by the way, I didn't mention it before, our farm is uh, just a little bit over 180 acres, and um, there's another 10 acres adjacent to that uh, that uh, my wife and I own individually. It isn't part of the farm. It's a piece of property that I bought years ago and just happened to butt up to the farm. Uh, so... The Washtenaw County Parks and Rec is actually who has the conservation easement on our farm. And uh, my wife and I donated the, the conservation easement for that 10-acre parcel to Legacy Land Conservancy. So we have that as a block together of, 190, of roughly 190 acres, a little bit more than that, um, 
fortunately, there are also some adjoining lands that have also been protected over the years. And uh, so we have a nice little, one of those big blocks like uh, Remy was saying, showing on the map. Um, the conservation of working farms helps um, nourish families, sustain our heritage, support the economy uh, well into the next century. These, these farms are part of our community and the way forward um, and the way forward will recognize the needs of people living on and serving served by our farms. Supporting today's farm and uh, farmers and cultivating the next generation. Uh, there's a comment here that I want to read. It was left on Legacy's website um, by a, a gal by the name of Heather back in August of 2017. And it, she says, there are so many benefits, both for rural and urban citizens, to keeping farmland safe and thriving. Not only is there a rustic beauty to it, but keeping fresh produce available and plenty of space for grazing animals to thrive is essential to keeping farming alive. Thanks for sharing. And I, I couldn't have said it better, you know, so I just had to pluck that quote right off of our, uh, our website. We, uh, there was some talk there. Uh, Remy noted some uh, statistics over a long, the long period of time, the number of farms uh, lost in the last, would you say, 50 years or? Oh, Kathy, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was Kathy. Um, and as we were sitting there, Jenny pointed out to me, that, that photo right there in the corner is from 1951. And it's basically the intersection of Stadium Boulevard and Liberty. And if you take a look at it, you can see we're sitting right up in the top left-hand corner of that picture right now. And you can see farmland all around there uh, that is now developed course. Um, so, you know, that's some of those acreage that have been lost over the years. Um, fortunately, we're, we're doing a lot at Legacy to uh, preserve more and more land. Uh, the uh, Legacy has a, is run, uh, as I said, it's a 501c3 organization. Uh, we have a board of directors uh, and we have a full-time staff. The office is located on Jackson Road. It's uh, 6276, I think, Jackson Road. We're right across from Menards, right across from Menards. <laughs> and uh, anybody is welcome to stop by anytime. There, there's usually somebody there for around 8 to 5 uh, weekdays. And uh, you can learn more about it. We also have quite a bit of literature out on the back table there uh, that you can help yourself to. So Jenny is going to talk about the Washtenaw County program. All right, so um, I manage the county's natural area preservation program. Um, similar to the Greenbelt, um, it, it is a property tax millage that was passed first in 2000. It's a quarter mill, 10 year long millage. So it was renewed um, in 2010. Uh, the focus of the, the county program is a little bit different than some of the township programs, a little bit different than the Greenbelt program, in the sense that we really do focus on the natural areas. Uh, so the first 10 years of the program, we were buying up land outright, primarily. Um, we've established a number of nature preserves. So here you can see the sign of Fox um, Science Preserve, which is in Sio Township. So you might see these signs all around, um, hidden along the roads. Um, these are open to the public. Um, they have nature trails, there's no other sort of park development. It's really just about enjoying nature. Um, and we have a whole stewardship staff that manages these properties, uh, manages those trails to keep them open for the public. Um, in 2010, when the millage was coming up for renewal, um, we had a lot of conversations because obviously natural areas and farmland don't necessarily know parcel boundaries. They don't follow those exactly. Um, and we also realize that farmland is a lot, is a big part of our natural areas, our soil resource here in Washtenaw County. And so the, the ordinance was actually changed to include agricultural preservation into our natural areas program. So since that time, we have been um, doing the more agri traditional agricultural preservation um, that Remy talked about um, earlier. So to date, 
Um, we've protected over 7,500 acres of land in Washtenaw County. That includes about 3,000 acres of farmland. Um, a lot of that, those acres are done with our partners, like Legacy, the Greenbelt, the Townships, and, even, and also Southeast Michigan Land Conservancy. Um, the county has contributed about 38 million towards uh, those projects and leveraged about 14 and a half million. So our leverage isn't quite as good as, as the green belt, um, but we're, um, we certainly all work together. A lot of times people think like, are you guys in competition with each other? And I was like, no, we all, we're all working towards the same mission. We all kind of, um, we all know each other really well. We all work really closely together. So this is not um, a competition at all. Um, <clears throat> so this is a map of Washtenaw County looking at the preserved land in the year 2000. So you can see we've got obviously the Waterloo Pinckney up here in the northwest corner of our county. Um, the darker green is public land, so it's either university owned, county owned, city owned land. And these lighter green pieces are actually conservation easements. So this is when the, the county's program first started. Um, at the time, the Greenbelt millage had not passed. The townships did not have millage programs. Um, Legacy was around. Southeast Michigan Land Conservancy was around. Um, but land preser preservation was really just kind of getting started, if you will. This is a map of what it looked like in 2010. So you can see a little bit of the difference here. We've got, obviously, the green belt um, was about seven years into the program. Uh, you can see this is at the, so Webster Township has um, a millage, and that was the first one was passed in 2005. It was just a five-year millage. And so this is at the end of Webster's first kind of round. You can see this big um, group here of conservation easements with Webster Township and the city's Greenbelt program. Um, you can start to see these blocks that were put together, as Remy was talking about. Um, obviously, a lot more in Ann Arbor Township. Ann Arbor Township is also one of the townships that has an approved millage, so you can start to see that progress. Um, <clears throat> and even some of the other properties out here that the county or legacy have, have added on to. And then this is current day. Um, there's a couple of these that are projected to be closed pretty soon, so we're maybe hopefully not counting our chickens before they hatch, but um, so to say. But you can start to see how much um, all of these blocks are put together. Um, once one farm is protected, usually, um, I always say the landowners are our greatest advocates out there. Um, they're talking, the farming community is very close knit here. They talk to one another. Um, so neighbors might get uninterested then. Um, and, and Remy also talked about earlier about farmers feeling like the, that it's viable here in Washtenaw County. Um, I started actually with the Greenbelt program back in 2005 originally. And farmers kept telling me, like, why should I preserve my land, Jenny? Because it's not going to be viable here in Washtenaw County um, for generations to come. I, I'm better off selling uh, for development. Well, now that we have these blocks, these farmers all work together. One of them's a great mechanic. One of them has other skills. And they can start to see and they can actually start to visualize that this is a viable option really close to several <laughs> Um, core urban areas where they can sell produce, they can sell their products. Um, here in Ann Arbor Township, this is probably some of the most expensive land outside of the city, but a lot of that's been able to be protected, and so it, they're super close to an urban core. This is where Green Things Farm is, Sealy Farm. You'll see them at the Ann Arbor Farmer's Market. You'll see them at local grocery stores. Um, this is where Hannah's working as well. Um, so it's a really, um, it makes it viable for farmers, for not only continuing farmers and who have been doing this for generations to work together, but also, as we said, for new and beginning farmers. So this is a pretty impressive map to see the difference from 2000 to 2019. And these programs are continuing. Um, our millage is up um, next year. Uh, the Greenbelt still has a number of years. Uh, the townships have gone back out to their voters. All of these have always passed with overwhelming support, so thank you. Um, and I guess that's it. This program was recorded on February 26, 2019 at the Ann Arbor District Library.